Well, good morning, everybody. How are you? Excellent. Well, I don't know if, if you ever had one of those mornings when kind of everything was going wrong, a little bit off track. I'm, ha I'm having one of those today. So I'll uh, ask you for your for your patience to indulge me here. I was hoping to use, um, you know, my headphones, but they just told me that it was out of power. Um, and so the audio that I'm hearing is a little bit low, but it, it's intelligible. And as long as you can hear me, um, that's great. Um, been a little under the weather for the last couple of days. And so a little fatigued, uh, a little low energy, not feeling so hot and got to go out this afternoon. Uh, got to go out, get an opportunity to go out this afternoon um, and give the uh, Black Liberation walking tour in person, which um, I'm always very excited to do. You know, it's a topic uh, that I have a lot of passion and connection to. And so firstly, I just want to thank you, Melody, for, for the invite. I uh, appreciate the class uh, wanting to have me here. It's a wonderful opportunity um, to talk about not only the tour, this has really been a chance for me to think somewhat about the process um, and, and, and how to share that and what I learned from that and uh, what messages are, are in there. And then have enormous gratitude to the future Histories Lab there at Cal for um, just lots of support it's been providing to the Hoover, my neighborhood here, the Hoover Foster neighborhood uh, over the summer through the work with the Friends of the Hoover Durant uh, Public Library uh, History Project. Um, this work and opportunity here to come and talk about storytelling. Um, and I'm looking forward to engaging um, with Susan and the rest of um, the staff and colleagues and students there about future projects. We've got, um, I've got some ideas that I've been pitching to, to Susan about some further engagements. Um, so with that, I'm going to see if I can share my screen here. Um, I'm not so great with Zoom or PowerPoint, but I think we can figure this out. Oh, I think I need the, need to do something here so I can share my screen. Oh, there it is. And I see the thing. That one. All right. Now you're able to see that. Got to get this bigger. All right. So I think you're seeing that. Um, so this this is the uh, Black Liberation Walking Tour. Our website is BLWT. Uh, dot org. It is a okay transition. Let me see the next one. There we go. It is a uh, it's focused on a particular neighborhood here that I live in. Uh, it's the Hoover Foster neighborhood here in Northwest Oakland. As an aside, one of the things I'm interested in is this: the changes in this designation. Uh, this is fairly recently been considered part of West Oakland. It, it, further in the past, it was considered North Oakland, and in between the two, it was kind of neither. So, um, but it is what it is now. I think of probably a common popular definition and probably workable definition and useful definition of West Oakland is the area inside the freeways bounded by 580, 24, 980, and 880. Uh, this neighborhood, this Hoover Foster designation is taken from two of the schools here that are close by, an elementary school and a junior high school that actually flopped between which one was elementary and junior high a couple times in the past. And then the um, now torn down Marcus Foster Middle School, uh, which I don't know how many are familiar with it. Marcus Foster was Oakland's first black public school superintendent. And he was assassinated by the Symbionese Liberation Army in the um, movements and the leftist movements of the early 70s when there was lots of vigor uh, around here, lots of discussion about liberation and revolution uh, and what was gonna happen. And unfortunately, um, he was assassinated. Uh, as some of you know, the SLA, Symbionese Liberation Army, was the same outfit that uh, kidnapped Patty Hearst of the Hearst dynasty. So that's the neighborhood. Um, 
how it began. So this little slide here talks a bit about the second great migration to Oakland, specifically uh, during World War II, when we saw Oakland go from, I think 1940s, about 4% uh, black population until you know, tens of thousands uh, folks poured in from the South, primarily Texas, Louisiana, and Arkansas uh, during the 40s and the 50s, um, and really, really increased Oakland's black population uh, by tremendous amounts, and at the same time, were really confined by segregation uh, to the lower bottomest part of West Oakland, um, primarily south of uh, or west of Adeline Street, probably before the war, you know, when the Pullman porters were very active, and this was a railroad terminus. Um, by necessity, you know, so many tens of thousands of Black folks poured in during World War II uh, that. Um, folks were allowed to live, had to, you know, found other places to live, you know, coming up until, you know, San Pablo, um, and eventually below East 14th uh, out in East Oakland. But East Oakland then was still uh, primarily uh, an all-white neighborhood. Um, and those folks that came here, you know, my uh, theory is that um, that Southern Black migrant, Southern Black rural culture that the migrants brought is um, a part of Oakland's cultural secret sauce. You know, we get a lot of folks coming here to Oakland for whatever the vibe is, and certainly the legacy of the Panthers and all that activism that they symbolize, um, you know, that they didn't start, but were part of that continuum of, uh, I think is part of what so many people find interesting and exciting about Oakland. That's large, large spirit of activism continues to operate today uh, in the face of all sorts of pressures, um, displacement and gentrification and economic um, uh, uh, um, scarcity, um, housing insecurity, economic security, that's the word I was looking for, uh, insecurities. But I, I would contend that you know, a lot of those cultural elements uh, found its way into um, the roots of what became a lot of our liberation movements here, not only black liberation movements, but many of the other liberation movements that were happening here in the 60s and the 70s, particularly um, gay rights, women's rights, free speech, um, ableism, just all the things that, you know, Berkeley, uh, North Oakland really became known for. Um, so there's a little, little bit about the tour, but really here today, I think we really want to talk about the process. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm a third generation West Oakland resident. Uh, maybe something that is fairly unique is I actually live now next door to the house that I was born in. Yeah, house I was born in, wasn't born in the hospital, was born up there in that back, back, back bedroom next door and was only able to come back because my family had acquired this uh, second house um, during so-called white flight during the 50s, uh, when the, between the redlining of these neighborhoods and then the incentives that were provided, you know, in San Leandro, where the Bazana family who lived here moved to, uh, as with suburbs all across the nation in that, in the 50s, in that post-war area, when the federal government we, you know, you, you, you know, we have a housing, you know, many people talk about a housing crisis you have now in Oakland, it's, it's not new. There was certainly a massive housing crisis um, in the forties, particularly and especially for black folks because we were restricted in the places that we could live. Uh, but then, you know, when the war ended and you had all these uh, servicemen returning, um, there was just not enough, gonna be enough housing for them. So the government set up on a, a policy and a practice to, to suburbanize uh, the United States and, you know, build housing uh, and certainly you know, create suburbs and freeways that they would service. Um, and then they use financial incentives um, to incentivize, you know, white families. And it was very clear this was white families because many of the suburbs were required to have uh, to sign an agreement with the federal government to be whites only in order to receive government bank guarantees so that the financing um, would pencil out for the developers. Um, and so, you know, those, these are the, the kind of the background and the context while we end up with, you know, as uh, 
um, as one of my favorite groups, Parliament Funkadelic said, um, you know, chocolate cities with their vanilla suburbs. You know, this is not an accident of people self-sorting by preference only, but as a policy, but you know, it was federal, state, county, city policies um, that incentivized us to have those. And so I am a, um, moved back here four years ago, um, was born here, you know, grew up around Oakland. Uh, my grandparents and my aunts and uncles and my cousins were always on this block. And so it was always and have always been, you know, tight, tightly um, aligned here. Uh, my uncle still lives, you know, next door. Um, and so I have really just seen a lot of changes, seen a lot of change, you know, in this neighborhood. Uh, I am a CPA by training, uh, active accountant by day. And so, you know, this is not something that I bring, uh, you know, a lot of expertise to, you know, this is, this was a project passion, um, just kind of, you know, and making it up as I go along. Um, and uh, I think that is particularly, can maybe particularly useful for some lessons, um, because this is not something I do professionally, but this was, you know, something that kind of happens on, on nights um, and weekends. Um, so to me and my wife here, um, I'm a hardcore Oakland sports fan. Fortunately, we're at many fewer teams. Um, and I'm just really passionate about all things town generally. So what is a tour? I mean, so the tour is a historical, cultural, art tour of some sites, you know, in the neighborhood. You know, we look at some of the historical black, you know, right now historical black residents um, that lived here from the 20s, you know, through the present. You know, we talk about um, some of the impacts to the neighborhood, you know, the freeways this is a way to get into conversations about justification and displacement and development, uh, government policy and the role of government policies uh, in place making and in, in our built environment. Um, and I wanted to, you know, and I like, you know, walking tours. And so uh, I like, I go on the tours that are around Oakland. If I travel, I like to go on, you know, tours. So I think it's a wonderful way at a human level, human scale uh, to get out and see things and hear people talk to you about history of place. I'm probably very interested in, in histories, um, both histories of places and also histories of families and, and movements and uh, peoples, you know, I'm always interested in hearing from people, how does your family end up here? And I'll, I'll just use here, uh, Oakland, because that's where we are, but wherever that migration may have been, um, and maybe even more fascinating, if, if you haven't migrated anywhere for hundreds of years, uh, which is more likely the case, maybe in some foreign countries, um, just that story, those stories of families, I think are just completely interesting. And so the tour is meant to do that. This tour is meant to open up, you know, a history of this neighborhood, because I have a, I mean, it's not just a sense, I mean, it's a fact that a lot of these histories are being lost. And that's something that happens all the time. You know, as, as neighborhoods change, um, as people pass away, um, as history is, is, you know, demolished and reconstructed, you know, we lose, you know, I think we lose a lot of those stories. And so as someone who's been around here for close to 60 years um, and seeing how much the neighborhood has changed and how many new neighbors there are, and just a lot of physical changes in the neighborhood, um, I was conscious that, you know, I know stories and histories are about a lot of these places um, that other folks don't know. And I really felt a need. This was really something that kind of bubbled up inside me that wanted to be out to, to share this. And then knowing, you know, some of the elders in the neighborhood, their stories and um, what it was like for them growing up around here, wanted to be able to find a way to take these stories, these oral histories of our neighborhood, combine that with archival research, be able to present that um, to, frankly, I was most motivated by my neighbors. Um, both long-term neighbors and newer neighbors um, to share with them, you know, some of the things that had happened in this neighborhood. I think I ran into a quote by, you know, the left landscape architect Walter Hood that talked about, um, you know, every, everywhere has uh, a history, has stories, if you're willing to dig them out. 
and very frequently stories in under-resourced neighborhoods aren't told and aren't dug out and told uh, with as much vigor as they may be in, in some other places. So that's kind of how I, how I came up with the idea, just wanting to share that. A primary motivator was just I had a bunch of people from the neighborhood over you know, to the house a few years ago. We were having a ballot discussion uh, about some of the elections. And after that was over, um, like some of the elders in the neighborhood just got to telling stories. And I looked at the people in my living room and they were in rapture. They were just was rapt attention um, to this. And I'm like, you know, there's, there's a hunger for this here. Um, and then we did a, um, a storytelling forum a couple of years ago uh, here at a local venue where we brought some folks together and it was really a big hit. And there's, uh, you know, there's, I think as you know, everybody's you're here in this class for a reason, there's a hunger to hear these stories. My hopes and aspirations of the, store, uh, the tour are pretty broad. Um, and I laid them out there because for me, um, the end game here is really trying to um, build community with my neighbors uh, and find, you know, people who are interested in being involved in helping to plot a future course of development in this neighborhood. You know, my vision uh, is that we're going to acquire a block uh, to be able to see, you know, the businesses, nonprofits, services, the spaces um, that this community wants to have for itself rather than leave that solely up to uh, outside developers to, um, to come up with. You know, but the challenge was, well, how do we, how do we get there? You know, we've got some neighborhood organizations here um, that are you know, not highly attended or not as highly attended as I would hope they would be. Um, and that uh, are not, don't always collaborate um, around their projects as tightly as, as could be. And so, you know, after, Kind of moaning about it for a while. I was like, well, you know, you know, moaning and do something. So I said, well, let's let's figure out um, how to do something. And I realized that this tour could be a way um, to build community, to bring together neighbors, to build our capacity to take on projects, um, and then that would give us to build our organizations, um, and that would collectively give us an opportunity uh, to be more successful in trying to chase down um, development opportunities here in the neighborhood. And so some of the development issues and trends that face West Oakland recently, uh, you know, it's the, it's the obvious ones. Massive homelessness, uh, significant displacement, which our latest census uh, numbers show that Black population in this neighborhood has decreased 25% since 2010, uh, which, you know, continues to break my heart. Um, uh, uh, you know, gentrification, you know, there's fights about what type of development is going to happen and where. You know, we recently got a grocery store, full service grocery store, you know, back in the neighborhood. That was a big win uh, after Safeway left here in the 70s. Um, and so these, these, these fights, these discussions, this activism around uh, homelessness, education, housing, economic security are, are the issues that are facing, you know, West Oakland. And they are the same issues that West Hi, Oakland has been battling for decades. All right, let me, let me speed up here because I'm going to... Uh, Take too long, and so I also wanted to just point out and, and that uh, Gene Anderson, who was a key contributor um, to this project and is um, a very uh, prolific tour developer and guide himself, is in the audience. And I'll, I'll uh, ask Gene some questions at this point, if we can. I mean, at this point, at some point, um, to bring him in. And so, who did I work with to create the tour, and how did relationships start and unfold? Well, I just mentioned Gene. Um, when I came up with the when I actually got funded to start the tour, and I was, this thing was like, oh, this is real. I need to figure out how to make this happen. Um, Gene was one of the first two people um, who I knew I, I just needed to have to make this successful. Um, and so I had I'd known Gene because um, I went on his tours uh, that he was leading. Um, you know, Oakland Urban Paths tours, City of Oakland history tours. Um, uh, he does the Open Wiki, and it's just I just knew that as far as the technical resource around developing tours, around historical research, uh, how to give a tour, you know, what are the elements of a good walking tour, that he was somebody that would be invaluable um, to this project. The other key contributor I identified was Liam O'Donoghue of the East Bay Yesterday podcast. Um, 
And if you haven't subscribed to that and listened to those, I highly recommend that you do that. Um, same thing for um, Gene and the Oakland Wiki and the Oakland or Oakland.net, I think is the um, website for some of his other tours. Um, this is because Liam is a, just a wonderful uh, interviewer. Um, he has really a magnificent ability to connect with all kinds of people and to get them to open up and tell them things that continue to surprise me that he's able to get people um, to just be so transparent about. And so those, those were the two um, key people I had identified. And then the third thing I knew I needed was someone around technology, um, how to um, develop a website and embed this. And then the, the other piece as well, you know, I've got a more than I got a full-time job and do lots of volunteerism. And so it was good, needed a project uh, manager to kind of help with you know, uh, the administration, connecting the dots, coordinating all the work, um, facilitating meetings and things like that. And so those were uh, kind of the key things that I needed. Um, and then we just divided up roles based on what people were interested or were good at. And so it was pretty clear that uh, the people that, you know, some of the people were paid, some of the people, a lot of the people volunteered. Um, and it was just a matter of, you know, hey, what do you, if you're, people got excited, were interested, what do you bring? Okay, let's figure out how to incorporate that. And so that, that division of roles was um, pretty easy. You know, my role, um, I think, was just to be enthusiastic, uh, provide a lot of energy and, and be infectious around um, the enthusiasm for the project. Uh, I think that was really key in attracting people to the project, motivating folks, um, and keeping it going. And so I kind of looked at my role as just the ringleader. Um, I just brought, you know, I brought the resource, the financial resource. Um, I assembled uh, a very extremely talented highly motivated team uh, of volunteers and paid folks. Um, and then it was just up to me to kind of get out of their way, um, let them do what they do. Um, you know, I was constantly just overwhelmed and amazed by the initiative, just the great ideas and the willingness and ability for people to say, hey, I got an idea and run with it and do it and execute on it. And so it was up to me just to fit those pieces together. Um, Number of stations, I pretty quickly just off the top of my head came up with like 30 stops, um, you know, using just things that I just off the top of my head and then some research that Gene did initially. Um, we compiled a list. We had 30 stops on the list um, and have uh, developed content for, for 10 of them so far. We were working against a, this work was done in the spring. I want to say maybe in, in really the bulk of it was in like two months. Um, and then we put, we put out a launch date of Juneteenth. So it was pretty intense. Um, and uh, I'm just happy that, um, that my team tolerated me. I think what they, told, what they said was, yeah, it was a fun project, but you know, they drove us pretty hard. Uh, and I think that's kind, of, that's kind of neat. It can be pretty intense. Um, what decisions did I have to wrestle with? Uh, geez, what decisions didn't I have to wrestle with? Who to, who, who to who to engage? And so we're, we're quite. We're going to have to wrestle. Let me step back a little bit. Firstly, it was like, what is this? As I was, you know, writing this grant application, I was like, what? Who is this? I heard this question. Who is my target audience? Um, and so for me, you know, my target audience was primarily was going to be my neighbors um, because I was some concern about this tour as a gentrifying force. You know, this started getting all kinds of, you know, publicity, and people were like. Um, Oh, this is cool. This neighborhood is cool. Trying to stay away from the cool factor. Now, I think we certainly all like amenities in our neighborhoods, um, but it's just, you know, it's just two sides of the same coin. You know, you don't get better amenities without increasing gentrifying pressure. And so talking with my grantor, my funder about that, um, that was a concern they had. They specifically referenced the Mission District in San Francisco. And that, um, yeah, there's lots of murals there that represent um, Latinx cultures, but not very many Latinx pe peoples anymore. And so they had concern about you know, turning this into a museum of you know, lost peoples, so to speak, um, rather than really making this uh, as an opportunity and a mechanism and a vehicle for future um, development. 
um, gee, and I'm, I'm forgetting probably the most important thing. And so the Friends of the Hoover Ramp Public Library, you know, we had a library here for decades uh, and it's been gone since 81. Um, I really looked at this, these oral histories, this archival research, this tour as part of the library's collection um, as a way to build, um, uh, let people know about the library's mission, to get publicity for the library's mission, to spread that uh, message and to support the library's mission to bring back the library. That was foundational to the development of this tour, which actually came out uh, of the library. This grant was actually made to the Friends of the River Durant Public Library, and it was born you know, out of uh, those efforts. Um, and so I, you know, who got involved to make those decisions? Those were really my decisions, you know, as the visionary, the founder, and the leader. Um, those were things that I, I came up with and decisions that I made. Um, Bringing on the team was interesting um, because frankly, I went, okay, this is Black Liberation Walking Tour. Um, and while this is a neighborhood that's seen all kinds of you know, races and ethnicities come through um, for some you know, short period of time, for some few decades, this was you know, almost an all Black neighborhood. Um, and you know, that's my experience. You know, this is almost an all Black neighborhood when I was born here. Um, and so that's what I connected with. That's what I resonated with. And that's, that's what I centered. Um, and so as I was thinking about hiring a team, I went, you know, I want to hire Black neighbors um, to do this work. Well, and so I came to my first decision point was, do I, I was trying to source those folks um, and didn't, wasn't able to um, find a whole lot of folks who had the capacity to do it. Everybody was extremely busy. Uh, folks that were doing this kind of kinds of work, there was lots of projects going on. And so my first decision point was, okay, do am I going to make this an all black thing, or am I going to reach out to people who I know have the competence and the, and the capability and ability um, to um, pull this off at a high level of expertise? Um, and so I want to be careful about, you know, making those things and uh, putting those two things in juxtaposition um, because, you know, most of the time, some people just need, you know, most times people need opportunity. And so the opportunity to work on this for people who may not have been as accomplished would have been a way to build that capability. Um, but I need, and so where I came down with, and this was through discussion with you know, some of the artists and some other folks and neighbors that were working on this, they were like, dude, get the best people that you can to tell the story. Be true to the story. If you hold the story first um, and always think about how you can deliver the best uh, experience to people, um, you'll end up in the best position. Uh, and I think that that's been a wise, wise counsel and a wise decision. Um, uh, often, uh, Ms. Alzheimer Baker Cook, the chair of the Friends of Hoover Act Prep Library, um, is, a, is a contemporary of my mom who grew up in this neighborhood going to climate in the 50s and was really a pivotal person around uh, oral histories. Um, she gave us her oral history. Um, she provided introductions to other folks. Um, and Liam has a just a wonderful ability to get people to open up. Um, and uh, so he collected those and we were focused on collecting first, collecting the oral histories about the tour stops that we wanted to do. So it was important to, to, sequence, to sequence those. Um, and then we had, uh, you know, to build on that, um, you know, we had a really, for me, interesting uh, discussions internally about leading the tour uh, on Juneteenth uh, when we launched it and we had a really big crowd. And so during the whole you know, process, um, you know, my team, um, to its credit, you know, some of the folks were like, you know, I'm not really, I'm not comfortable you know, leading a black liberation walking tour because I'm not black. And that doesn't seem appropriate um, I don't want to be out front, you know, don't want to be getting credit. Uh, I would rather, you know, just want to stay behind the scenes. And so I think that's something, you know, that um, ownership, uh, you know, I think ownership in air quotes of culture uh, is an important topic and high, and high uh, vi highly visible and focused on topic these days. And so um, because, and that also is reflected in who's staffing in the tour. And so that was something that internally, you know, we talked about, you know, as a team, and because the people, the non-Black folks that worked on this project are just so highly respectful of the content and the neighborhood and, you know, the and all the feelings and issues that go around with that, 
um, you know, I encourage them to step up, you know, yeah, this is not your story, nor your, your history, nor your culture, but you were instrumental in pulling this together. And fundamentally, I believe what we need is, you know, when uh, white folks can tell black history stories as good as black folks, we've made some progress. So I think it's important um, that we allow opportunities for people to not, um, not, take, not appropriate our story, but to be able to share them. And so I think this is going to continue to be an ongoing, you know, discussion. How am I doing on time here? That's been amazing. Um, the people who have gone, you know, the response I got to the idea for the people that clicked that clicked with it uh, was just am amazingly affirming. That other people thought this was a great idea and were just as excited about it as, as I was. Um, the feedback I've gotten from the few folks I've been able to connect with that have taken the tour has just been extraordinary. Um, they've really, really appreciated it. You know, we've gotten some donations to continue to work on the tour for, for some folks. Um, some of the neighbors, you know, neighbor down the street that who's on a tour stop uh, has talked about uh, the folks that you know stop this is the groups of people that she sees in front of her house and she finds that rewarding because they're interested um in that history um you know advice that i may have for people who want to put something together like this is to um is to be passionate uh if there's something that uh topic that you're passionate that show and feed that uh when i started out that was the only thing i had and that was how i ended up and then eventually um, building this thing out. Um, as I said, we've gotten you know, 10 of the 30 in this neighborhood. Uh, the bigger vision is to make this a, a biking tour and then a uh, bus tour around Oakland to really continue to build out um, the sites. Um, and then to you know, also, you know, uh, I founded a nonprofit out of this, the West Oakland Cultural Action Network, to go after some of these larger um, neighborhood and community-based issues to push to put some activism and some organizing around that. Um, so building out that, I've uh, got to continue to recruit my board um, and, you know, around that. Um, this project, you know, continues to support the library. You know, we always want to talk about um, that story about that hey, library. Dave. Yeah. Dave, can you hear me? Yeah. Um. I'm going to pause you for a minute. Our TV went out. So if you give us a couple minutes, we'll be back on. And then I'd love for you to pick up right where you were. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. All right, so, okay, Dave, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, will you start back, um, say a sure. couple minutes before I stopped you? Yeah, and I'll, I'll wrap this up. I just realized, oh, geez, I'm way over time. Okay, I'm, sure Gene, yeah. I'm, I'm sure Gene's not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good. Let's let's wrap it in five minutes, and I want you to be able to make your final comments, and then we'll pivot to some student questions. Yeah, I want to get to the question. It's always the funnest part. Right? Okay, sounds good. Um, and so what what are we you know what's left? And so many things. And so I want to be able to to hire folks, youth. From the neighborhood, seniors, elders from the neighborhood, uh, you know, unhoused people from the neighborhood to take people on this guided tour. I really think it probably, I think having a guide from the neighborhood adds to it. Um, want to be able to just go out and collect oral histories from anybody who wants to give them from this neighborhood. It doesn't have to be people who have been here a long time. You could have moved here yesterday. Everybody has a story. So I want to build uh, an archive of oral histories. Um, 
there is, I want to do a West Oakland Black Baseball Tour. Ran into a guy who's got some amazing content uh, from the early, from, you know, the early part of the last century around, you know, semi-pro Black baseball teams um, in West Oakland. Um, and, you know, for folks who don't know, and I don't think probably won't know, the number of um, baseball players that came out of West Oakland that, in, that had an impact on the game uh, is amazing. You think about this is a really a small community. And so between the, it's just, it's what, it's just mind boggling to me. And so I think there's a lot there around, not only the baseball teams, you know, some of the basketball players, um, you know, Bill Russell and whatnot, you know, even things like a, uh, a roller skating race from 7th Street to San Pablo Park in Berkeley and back, things like that. I think that is rich, rich historical content that I want to be able to, to bring to people and then be able to develop a process and a platform and a tool so that when other people want to create tours, we're able to you know, provide a, a, a way um, to support that. Um, so those are some of the other you know, projects that I'm, that I'm dreaming on. Um, and I guess, well, I'll, I'll stop there and uh, go for questions. Uh, and I'm just wondering, how do you think somebody who's not native should relate themselves to the East Bay and I guess Oakland in particular? Um, I don't feel like I really have a place that I'm from because I've kind of moved around a lot. So I have trouble relating to folks in that way. And yeah. Okay. Um, great question. If I, if I, if I heard, understood it, it's how does somebody that's not native to the East Bay relate to the East Bay? Um, this is, this is a big political, social fight discussion that we're having now. Um, we, you know, there's a word that goes around, um, colonizers. Um, and it's meant to, um, it's, 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 it's meant to be hurt, hurtful, um, but I think it also can be uh, accurate description. And so what I, what I end up, as someone who is passionate and parochial about my Oakland, and boy, I will play the third generation card on you in half a second if I think you get out of pocket. Uh, I, uh, at the other side of that, uh, uh, just as I invited the non-Black folks on the tour to um, step up and, and you know, take a visible role, we're all here now. And we have to figure out how to all be together. And so what I tell my neighbors is, you know, you don't get to just come here and step back because some people are going to scream at you as, as not being a native. Um, you got to, you know, figure out how to get, develop a thick enough skin to, to add your input. I think it's essential um, that everybody participates, you know, in the doings in our civic matters and our civic doings. Um, the stories, you know, you know, my, my, the story of my, my grandparents coming here, um, that migration story is, is, you know, we're not, you know, we're not Ohlone. I'm not Ohlone. We're, I haven't been here forever. I too, uh, my family, my folks came here from somewhere else at some other time as well. Um, it is part of the stories of places, particularly this place where so many, you know, peoples have come through. So I think it's essential to step up and share your wisdom, um, to share, you know, your experience, your knowledge um, of your story where you're from um, and to add that into this gumbo. Um, I don't think it's a melting pot to this stew, you know, these elements that, that are here now. The trick is how do you do that, right? And so I think there are certain issues and forums um, where you just need to listen. And so I think listening is essential. Um, you know, there's a lot of folks with a lot of trauma and they have a lot of, a lot of negative experiences. Um, I mean, this is this can be a really emotional topic for me. It can really open up um, a lot of wounds um, because around the damage that urban renewal did here in this part of Oakland in the 50s. 
Um, you know, these freeways and the destruction of these neighborhoods and these businesses and these homes and the displacement can, can, will never be undone. You know, if we are ultimately lucky, we'll figure out how to do some kind of reparative work to mitigate the damage, but it will never be undone. Um, and so to, to learn that history and to kind of understand where folks are coming from um, and to acknowledge that, I think that's a great foundation um, to, to come from. Uh, but personally, I get frustrated, and don't take it personally, I get frustrated um, by some of my neighbors who don't want to uh, participate in difficult discussions um, around what it means to live here, uh, around you know what it means, what around our vision and aspirations for policing or development, um, you know things like that. Because we're all here now, we all have to figure out how to get along. Um, and every the more everybody's contribution, I think, is necessary. The more contribution we get uh, from residents. Um, I think the stronger, you know, will be in residents organizing to get what it is that we would like to have and see rather than leaving that to city hall or uh, the administration or the council or developers or whatever that is. And, and you know, and, and I say that, um, and I know I'm using some, some terms that may carry some meaning for people um, because I am not, um, you know, I'm not an anti-development person. You know, I don't think that we should stop building housing. Uh, I think building, I, I live in a house. Somebody developed it in 1912. Um, and I think the only way that we can make places for more people to live is continue um, to build. Of course, the question is, what's that mix look like? And so I think it's essential uh, for all folks, including the newest folks and folks of any length of term to engage in our city processes and discussions. And to tell their stories of how they got here. I mean, that's super interesting. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I went to do the walking tour yesterday. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, I was wondering about um, how you relate to the sense of loss that comes with these history tours in a way. For example, in the podcast, you shared that Flint, the barbecue place for those who haven't been yet, started back up. But when I was there yesterday, uh, the place was completely deserted and there was a, a rent sign. And yeah, one of the things I kept thinking about last night was this question of like, how to relate to this appearance of loss that then can also reproduce into the future, a feeling of loss, mm -hmm. um, right? Where there's also, of course, the danger of nostalgia. Mm -hmm. And a second question maybe to that would also be because there, Unfortunately, I saw some police last night. And I was wondering how you relate liberation to questions of abolition um, in terms of police abolition or police defunding. And yeah, how you relate to that because that didn't really, it wasn't part of the stories mm -hmm. because they're very personal stories, but I could imagine liberation relating to that for you. Excellent questions. Yeah, um, Simon, sorry. yeah excellent questions. And so, I'm always have to be careful about wallowing in nostalgia. Um, basically, a lot of I think what motivated me was nostalgia for the neighborhood um, that I grew up in, with the false memory of how of this was this this really nice place. Because um, in the late '60s and early '70s, this was a declining commercial strip, you know, suffering from the beginnings of the DN. That's something the beginning, but suffering from you know late stage deindustrialization in Oakland, uh, when so many uh, working class jobs you know moved away, um, and so you know a lot of times I pine for um, it was very personal for me. You know, this is you know I live I live with ghosts for I live with ghosts. You know, I'm just, I live in a place where my grandparents lived. You know, it's you know, memories of me as a child and, and and with them are always ever present. You know, my first three months here, I didn't know if I would be able to continue to live here because it was, um, it felt like living in the past and the present at, at the same time. Um, and I, I found that, you know, um, really, really difficult. And it really, it does, it opens up a lot of loss for me. And so when I, I, I get really, it's really painful to understand um, you know, what Urban Renewal you know, did to, to West Oakland. Um, uh, and then what the whole regime of, 
you know, redlining and suburbanization did to this metropolitan area to kind of to urbanize poverty and suburbanize wealth. Um, these are painful topics. These are these are things that exist. Um, I continue to see, you know, what I cultural erasure, and that's was really a, a motivation here for me was was to attempt to preserve, you know, some of these cultural stories um, that you know, uh, that we know about here and, and to save those. And so, you know, frankly, there's times when I just weep. I just weep at the loss. Uh, and I think, you know, that can be somewhat, you know, let that out and you want to keep it bottled up. Uh, you, know, it's, you know, it's taken me to be very old. Uh, you, know, you know, I guess it, you know, it would get later in my life to be able to allow myself to, to do that and not just stuff it down. Um, and so it's help. I think it's, it's, it's not necessarily always healing, you know, to always just, you know, um, think about these stories of loss, but they are, it, it, it happened. And these are things that happened. Um, and so my motivation, motivation is to, is to capture those, you know, for future um, residents, future people, just so that they are aware of these people and these stories of this place um, through a certain era. And that's really difficult. Um, yeah, the police were down there yesterday. Um, and so up on uh, corner of my block here up at, up at San Pablo, um, there's some real challenges there, you know. Uh, it's an active drug dealing spot. Um, you know, there's been shootings, you know, there's this, when the bullets start flying, you know, they don't have a name on it. Um, and a lot of the residents around here, uh, we're like, hey, we, we, we need to stop. We want to see, and, and it's difficult because you know sometimes the dealers they intermix themselves with uh, unhoused people and use them for cover, um, and so then it's like oh those homeless people are doing stuff. Well, no, it's it's those dudes that drive up here in those cars uh, that that you know they jump in and drive off in these nice late model cars when when the shooting goes and they go away, and so that question about abolition is is an interesting one, um, you know as as some, none of, I don't think any of the long, any of the longtime residents here, any of the black folks of my age and ilk are supporters of abolition, right? Um, and I think it is a concept and a theory that's important because it provides political space to argue for uh, the reallocation of police resources and the social services. Um, but you know, I had uh, like, you know, like so many, other people, you know, my family has been touched by gun violence and murder. Um, and if you were to, and, and you know, the murder was never caught. And if you were to tell me, if you had been caught, if you were to tell me that oh, we're going to let him out of prison, I, I don't think his, not only anybody in my family would support that. You know, I would, I know his mama would, um, and you know, we were certainly concerned um, that his dad was going to go out there and take retribution into his own hands. And so. My experience, I'm just going to talk about my experience here just growing up here. My experience here growing up is some people that need to be out of society for some periods of time. There are, there are predators out here. Um, and certainly some of these, these predators are made by environment and circumstance. Um, but, you know, what do you do um, or, or with the dude that came and, you know, you know, stuck up my elderly uncle at gunpoint for all his expensive camera equipment? Um, and so, you know, I, I don't know that you want to throw somebody in jail and, and, and throw with key. Um, but I think there is, I just, just point like, look, when I was running around, I was never, you know, when I was a kid, when I was running around as a kid, there was just some people that were predators and they wasn't going to mind nobody. And they just need to be separated from society. Now, a lot of those, a lot of folks, they get tired of going to jail. You're going to be about 40. And they're like, yeah, I ain't, I'm, I'm done with that kind of life and lifestyle. So these are complex and complicated issues. Um, and I think we need people who have all kinds of beliefs, all pushing for what they we believe in so we can end up with a multiplicity of, um, I won't say solutions, but of ways to address our issues. Thank you, David. So we have time for one more question. And I see there's a great question in the chat too. So um, 
Yep. Yeah, let's take Olivia's question and then we'll go from there. Perfect. All right. Uh, concern of the tour becoming too Hi, David. Tour. Thank you. Yeah. Um, could you speak a little more about uh, your experience of putting the tour out in the world and what it's been like for you as people have responded to it? Uh, I guess also if any of those responses have been surprising or challenging um, and uh, who you've seen experiencing the tour. Is it a lot of your neighbors? And I know you mentioned that you uh, primarily designed the tour for them or yes, just curious to hear more about the response in general. Thank you. Yeah, these are, these are, yeah. I mean, these, this is core stuff. Um, let me try to remember to get to this. So who have I seen? I, I don't, so <laughs> I ha don't think very many of my neighbors have, have went on the tour. Um, you know, I don't have a tracking mechanism. That's something I need to build in to figure out who, who's taking the tour and, and to get their feedback. But it really seems like um, certainly, certainly many of my neighbors have taken it, but I've seen many, what I perceive to be many more people um, come, <laughs> come out uh, and, and do the tour. Um, and so that's been, that's been difficult. Um, one of the things that we see that I've also seen that I've talked to some other uh, community-based organization leaders about is around what the volunteers look like. Um, it's hard. It's been difficult to get Black volunteers from a neighborhood. Um, and, and I think that's been common around a, a bunch of other projects. And I think the reason for that maybe is Black people, we're just tired. We're tired of doing free work. We're tired of doing free work, telling people about our neighborhoods and our stories because they've been coming here asking us questions about our neighborhoods and our stories for a long time and nothing ever changes. Um, and so that is disappointing to me, um, but I, well, at the same time, I understand it, um, but I think that can be, be surprising for, for folks. And so that also helped me to realize I need to get the people, take the people who are willing to participate and support this um, and, and work with them to really get this done. Most surprising thing, and um, Jean is gonna, um, help lead, help support and lead the tour uh, um, this afternoon. Uh, the former St. Augustine's church site, which is for me, is just an iconic and hallowed ground here. It's where, you know, Black Panther Party started having you know, an early meeting place. Um, the father there really turned away Oakland Peace Police Department they wanted to run up there and get them way earlier in their formation. I mean, they may have never got, it's possible they may have never gotten off the ground if the Oakland Police Department would have came up there and arrested everybody right at the beginning. Um, and so he's really a hero, I think, to me. And I think his story is way under told um, because, you know, he wasn't a Panther, but he, he facilitated them. The pastor of that church, when I had a group out there, the pastor of that church came out and said, we don't want you, we don't want to be on the tour. No, and I, I, my jaw hit the ground. I mean, what do you mean you don't want to be on the tour? I mean, this is a historic spot. This is, you know, history happened here. And what he said to me was, you know, weren't the Black Panthers controversial? And if I'd have been wittier on my feet at that point, I would have been, well, not in this neighborhood. Because, but, but as I say that, yeah, they were too. I mean, you know, it was not a group that my, like my grandmother looked upon favorably. So he tells a story about how he brought the Panthers in and allowed them to meet there. And then one day they met the congregation and they realized um, they had a whole lot in common in their care for the neighborhood. And so that was probably the single most um, surprising thing for me. And so we'll be out there later this afternoon um, to, see how it goes uh, to continue to re-engage. But I think it's important to continue to re-engage with them because it really does reflect what was going on at the time. You know, in, when the Panthers were first formed, there was a tremendous tension um, between um, the Maoist revolutionary philosophies and a lot of the Black folks from the rural South um, who were landowners, you know, property owners. Um, and they just didn't, you know, I think the... Panthers despise kind of that, that property ownership. And as they evolve into um, the you know, social service programs, the feeding, the schools, uh, that I think that's when they got a lot more acceptance um, from you know, middle-aged and older 
um, Southern Black migrants, they always have the youth and the energy. That's a really good question as well. Thank you, David. So we have another great question in the chat about um, digging a little deeper into gentrification, but we're we're just running out of time today, a couple minutes before class closes. So I would say thank you, public attendees, for asking that. We're going to roll that question forward into our conversation the rest of the semester. Um, thank you so, so much, David, for spending your morning with us. And um, yeah, I think we students, we all got a lot out of it, a lot to keep thinking about. Um, so yeah, thanks again for joining us. Awesome. Um, BOWT.org, check it out. You can find um, uh, the tour there. You can reach out to me if you've got any other kind of questions or, or things you want to talk about. I'm at uh, BleacherDave at gmail.com. Um, and uh, continue to um, uh, do this work and then to do these classes. It's, I think, telling these stories is really important. And I look forward to being in the audience at some future classes. You've got some really interesting upcoming guests for me that I can learn a whole lot from. Thanks, like I said, I'm yeah, making up as I, I go you know, I think the tour, it would be great for them to email you with their feedback to keep that conversation going. Thank mm -hmm. you.